Good evening and welcome to the March 2nd, 2015 meeting of the Lake Forest City Council. Could I ask the clerk to call the roll, please? Certainly. Honorable Mayor Schoenheider? Here. Alderman Waldeck? Here. Alderman Beidler? Here. Alderman Moore? Here. Alderman Pandelion? Here. Alderman Tack? Here. Alderman Reisenberg? Here. Alderman Edelman? Here. Alderman Moreno? Here. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much, Betty. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Uh, first item on the agenda this evening is reports of city officers. Uh, first under that is comments by mayor. I'd like to take the opportunity to read a proclamation about Arbor Day, if I would. Whereas Arbor Day will be officially observed in the state of Illinois on Friday, April 24th, 2015, by proclamation of the governor and the planting of trees on Arbor Day is a traditional activity throughout the state and the city of Lake Forest. And whereas Lake Forest, with its environment of natural areas, is particularly dedicated to the observance of this day and has consistency throughout its history enacted ordinances to preserve its trees and other natural assets. <clears throat> Whereas citizens groups, garden clubs, private and public institutions have actively supported preservation efforts and the renewal of natural acres through tree planting and landscape projects. And whereas the celebration of Arbor Day 2015 in Lake Forest will include the distribution of 2,000 red oak seedlings to students in public and private elementary schools and Arbor Day 2015 will be celebrated throughout the day in programs at schools and other locations. And at West Park, located at 850 Summit in Lake Forest, and on Friday, April 24th at 10 a.m., where the city's annual Arbor Day trees, one bur oak tree, will be planted. And whereas trees in our city, wherever they are planted, increase property values, enhance our business and residential areas, beautify our community, and are a source of joy to gladden the hearts and promote the environmental well-being of present and future generations. And whereas the City of Lake Forest has been recognized as Tree City USA for 34 consecutive years by the National Arbor Day Foundation. Now therefore, I, Donald P. Schoenheider, Mayor of the City of Lake Forest, do hereby proclaim Friday, April 24, 2015 as Arbor Day in the City of Lake Forest, and I urge all citizens to support the efforts to protect our trees and woodlands, to support our city's forestry program, to plant trees on this day and to join in the celebration ceremonies. In witness thereof, I here under set my hand and have had the seal of the city of Lake Forest affixed to this, this 24th day of April, 2015. Next item on the agenda, emergency telephone system board ETSB meeting. I'd like to open a, the public meeting for the ETSB and ask for a uh, call the roll, please. Honorable Mayor Schoenheider. Here. Alderman Waldeck. Here. Alderman Beidler. Here. Alderman Moore. Here. Alderman Pandelion. Here. Alderman Tack. Here. Alderman Reisenberg. Here. Alderman Edelman. Here. Alderman Moreno. Here. Police Chief James Held. Here. Deputy Police Chief Carl Waldorf. Here. Fire Chief Jeff Hall is absent. Thank you, Betty. Chief Held. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of Council, and members of the ETSB. Uh, I just want to give a quick update on where we are with our central dispatching. As most of you know, uh, back in September of 14, we uh, decided to centralize our dispatching system with neighboring communities of Highland Park, Lake Bluff, Highwood, and be dispatched out of the Highland Park Police Department uh, by, uh, by Glenview employees. Um, since that time, um, I would say it's gone exceptionally well. Um, I am not quite honestly aware of any complaints that have come into the police department. Uh, I don't want to speak for the city manager's office, but I'm not sure that they've received any complaints regarding anything from residents on how the dispatching is going. So from a, an exterior uh, standpoint, as far as the, uh, the calls are being answered, the calls are being dispatched, and uh, fire and police units are responding accordingly, it's gone very well. I will say that there have been some internal uh, issues that we're working through, mostly operational type of things, technological things, but we've checked a lot of those off the list. We're still moving forward, getting some other things taken care of. So uh, it's, it's, really, it's really gone exceptionally well from that standpoint. Um, 
the dispatching, I think, has been exceptionally well by the Glenview employees. Uh, it's a very concise method of dispatching. Uh, our officers have been very uh, complimentary of how the dispatchers have functioned for them. Uh, not a lot of wasted time. The calls are being dispatched very timely. They're getting them out from the time of the call to the time people are dispatched in a very quick manner. Um, so, so from that standpoint, working very well. Uh, the full redundancy, which is one of the benefits of going to the centralized dispatching, is, is progressing along. It's not quite completed yet, but it's progressing along. And probably by the end of this year or next year, it should be completely done. Um, one of the wonderful little side effects that came of this whole thing is both our department and the fire department, our um, radio frequency had dramatic improvement. Uh, the fire department, that was part of the, the plan all along to have their frequencies upgraded so they would be able to um, communicate better. They also had to change their frequency from the one they were on before to the Highland Park fire frequency. Took a little time, it's done and it's working great for them. They can now actually hear at the beach, which was a problem before, that always was for us also. We also, on our end, uh, our East Shore radio network that we belong to, decided to upgrade all the frequencies for members of the East Shore radio network, which comprises all of the consolidated communities, plus a few other communities. So we went to a whole new system of microwave transmission, which um, solves a lot of problems, solves our beach problems. It's, it makes our communications, whether it's in the hospital, in, in the high school, where we always had a challenge communicating with our radios, we can now do that a lot better. So that was, that was one of the things that came about that we weren't planning on as being a nice side benefit of this dispatching um, <coughs> consolidation. Um, so one of the things we have been struggling with a little bit is our lobby video camera, um, which um, it works. We test it daily. Maybe it works one day, maybe not another day. I think there's just some, uh, again, it's te technological things, some uh, connect connectivity part. Glenview is working on their end to make sure there's nothing going on on there. The phone will work. Sometimes the video doesn't work. So we're getting through that, but I think uh, all in all, uh, working very well for the most part. Um, one of the other issues, and I think uh, I know that Mike Thomas has had this problem. During the first couple of ish snow issues, we had a little call out problems. And that was again, more of an operational thing with the Glenview dispatchers knowing who to call and when to get the right people out for the snow emergencies. Uh, nothing dramatic, nothing that you know, really caused any major issues, just maybe woke the wrong person up in the middle of the night that didn't need to be woken up. So um, that's going through and Mike's staff have been great about communicating who's on call when there's an upcoming uh, snow event or any type of a storm. So that's been working out really, really well that way. Um, I can answer any questions um, anybody might have. Yes. So, um, so Chief Held, if, if somebody is there, um, Forgive me, I, I, I should, well, maybe it's a good thing. I haven't actually had the experience okay. of going in there and trying to make this work uh, in, a, in an emergency. But it feels like s s what you're describing is a person could actually be there in, at the police station talking to the central dispatch person but not being able to see them and maybe not being able to hear them or see them? Or? Uh, it's usually just the video part, um, and that's why we check it every day to make sure. And there are instructions to, to yes. about, about what to do in that situation, but usually you can hear them. Usually you can hear them. Usually see the phone okay. part is working. It's, usually, okay. it's the video part that, we're, that they've been struggling with the most, and that was, that was one thing that our city and Lake Bluff all, all wanted was to have the, the two-way video as opposed to just a phone. It's just not, okay. It's just, it's just not 100% right now. Okay, okay, but there's, but there's always a backup. I mean, usually the phone, I think you said sometimes the phone is out and I got it. Uh, we've run into it a little bit. That hasn't been recent though. Um, the company that installed the software and the hardware for the screen, um, they've been out several times. Uh, the, the IT people have looked at it and for the most part now the phone is functioning as a phone, okay. but the video is where, where, where it struggles sometimes. You'll get that, you'll get a blank screen and it may confuse people. They just got to realize they can still talk on the phone and we could probably put some, uh, some kind of better instruction up there to say, just keep Ask talking. Ask about signage. Yes, to, we can yeah. do something better with that, I think. Okay, thanks. Anything else I could answer? Oh, how yes. many, I'm just curious, how, how often, uh, you know, how many times a week um, does someone come in after hours and uh, have a question or, you know, and, and use that audio video uh, set up in the lobby? Not that many. Um, I, I couldn't give you a number. Unfortunately, the software can't really, you can't track how many times it's used during whatever time of day, but it's not that many. Uh, I, would, I would venture a guess 
maybe 10 times a week. It, that's probably a lot though. And a lot of those are usually what we used to get uh, when we had dispatch there was, uh, it might've been somebody there just lost looking for directions. We used to get limo drivers all the time coming into the police station looking for an address or people looking for address that said Lake Forest, but they're actually unincorporated Lake Forest. That's usually what we get after 10 o'clock for the most part. Um, doesn't mean we haven't had people come in looking for assistance or looking to get somebody dispatched to the, the police department to take care of their problem though. Chief, I have a question, but it's probably not for you. Um, I guess George or Bob, the surcharge, which was established in 89, has not <coughs> been revised, and it looks like we're 30 to 30, maybe 30 cents, or George, I hate to say this, 50 percent <laughs> uh, below market. Are we, are we looking at that? Uh, we haven't Elizabeth been until not now. Here, so maybe it's not I, a right. fair question. But. I was I was going to bring up a similar, a related question, which if you look at the fund balance as it projects out into the future, it starts to get pretty healthy, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, maybe we're charging too much, um, you know, given the cost structure that we've got now. But I it, clearly <clears throat> we don't. I don't think we need to keep four hundred thousand dollar fund balance. Yeah, I, and I, I you know, without uh, being able to say exactly, you know, there there are costs that will be getting occurred. When we bought our laptops out of there, I know the fire department. There's been a few costs um, that have been deferred to later years that they wanted to get part of the central dispatching, like station <coughs> alerting. Uh, their laptops also bought siren maintenance for the the warnings. So there are a lot of costs in there that probably aren't uh, in there. They have to be requested out of the budget, though. Okay. Yeah. yeah I, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that um, we can talk about this at the March 9th budget meeting as well, but. The, um, the reality is, is that we were actually gearing up to completely replace all of our dispatching equipment, and that's when we then used the other alternative. So some of the funds that we were, build, we were building up were for that purpose. But I think also over a period of time, and I think, Alderman, to get to your point, um, that uh, the city attorney can correct me, but I think the rate has to be set by referendum. So we would have to go out to the community to raise that rate, which some communities have done. Uh, but I think unless we had a specific capital expenditure that we could go to the public and explain why we're doing that, I think it would be very difficult to do. That's not going to work. Right. I, I'll uh, echo what Bob was saying. If you look in the materials, it did show that our referendum question was for the 65 cent charge. That's the extreme or extent of our authority unless we go back out to referendum. We can reduce it if we choose without losing that authority, but we cannot exceed it. I was just thinking, you know, with what's going on at Springfield, we're going to need some additional sources of revenue, right. and this yeah. might be a likely source, but however, not, yeah. no, one, that's not going to, no one wants to. One thing about the ETSB surcharge is that there are specific uh, realms of, of expenditures we can make with it, um, and, and while we may not be uh, making full use of that scope of expenditure. It's not a general revenue source. Do salt bays qualify? <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't hear, but I, I doubt salt it. <laughs> Do salt bays qualify? Uh, <laughs> I, I can research that if you'd like. An <laughs> extensive conversation. <laughs> anything else I can answer? Anything else for Chief Held? The budget, anything else? Nothing. If not, um, I will ask for approval of the ETSB board of the previous expenditures as outlined in the attached expense summary and approval of the FY15 amended budget year estimate and approval of the FY2016 ETSB budget request as presented. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Do I have a second. second? Roll call vote, please. Honorable Mayor, Mayor Schoenheider. Aye. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Beidler? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. Police Chief James Held? Aye. Deputy Police Chief Carl Waldorf? Aye. 11 yay, 0 nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Biddy, very much. I need a motion to close the public meeting of the ETSB. So moved. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, the motion has passed. That concludes my comments this evening. Next time on the agenda, comments by City Manager Bob Kiley. We should have a motion to close the ETSB. He did. We just did. He just did. Like I said, good job. <laughs> just say hi, <laughs> I want to keep up with us, Vic. We're moving here. <laughs> moving fast. <laughs> See, he bills by the minute. That's the problem. He's trying to slow this thing down. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, now I've completely lost what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> back earlier uh, in the year, the city council heard me make a presentation about sort of priority goals for the year and <clears throat> mentioned the fact that there's going to be a lot of activity that's going to take place in the city of Lake Forest uh, during 2015 and very positive, con uh, constructive work that's going to take place, but it will be disruptive uh, to our residents. The uh, staff is here this evening to present a, um, a new program that we have ready to go online um, on the city's website that will be accessible for, whoops, somebody's microphone's not on. Um, so um, what we wanted to do was to bring this to your attention because hopefully this will be a tool not only for our residents to use, but for you to use. And if you receive calls from residents, that you can direct residents to uh, the website so that they can uh, hopefully get the information that they want. And this is all being uh, driven through our GIS system. And so it's very interactive and hopefully very informative to the residents and can uh, hopefully answer some of their questions before then. So uh, with that, uh, Susan Banks, I'm going to ask uh, our communications manager, Susan Banks, to come up and in, uh, provide more background. And then I think she's going to turn it over to uh, our GIS expert um, <clears throat> to take it from there. So Susan. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. As Bob um, mentioned, there are construction projects going on all over town. While all these things have been brewing, we've been trying to figure out the best way to communicate these to residents on kind of an at-a-glance basis. And um, so, let me just bring up the website. So, uh, we've been working very hard as a team to pull together all the construction projects that are going on in every corner of the city. And if you see the orange uh, cone up there, that is what you will be clicking on to check this construction sites area on the website. Um, it has all the projects that are definitely taking place, whether or not they are city projects or hospital projects or uh, the Laurel Avenue development. It will also contain projects that are definitely going to happen, but we don't know when and projects that may happen and just to keep uh, on, the, on the site so that when stuff does happen, we can add it. Um, it's gonna be a very dynamic um, spot on the website that's going to be changing all the time after all of Kathy Zerniak's meetings, after all the public hearings as we get um, new drawings, new uh, photographs, new maps, new road closures, all those sort of things. So anyway, um, it's a really cool thing that's been developed by our GIS consultant. And uh, Joseph Pulveda is here tonight to go through the story maps, which <clears throat> is something they developed and I think we're going to be using a lot. So, Thank you, Susan. Uh, again, my name is Joe Sepulveda. I am a consultant and I've been here for about three years. And I help manage all the city's GIS infrastructure. And as Susan said, for about the past, well, I'd say three months, we've been really trying to develop a way that both residents and um, city staff can immerse themselves in the ongoing construction projects and really make it as intuitive as possible. So as Susan mentioned, we do have this construction sites link on the city's homepage. Clicking that will launch an interactive map labeled ongoing construction projects in Lake Forest. There's sort of two main layouts here. On the left, you'll see a panel, and that will have all of our information about a particular project. And on the right, that's more of a sh spatial aspect of that project. So you can see here, it defaults to a zoomed out view of the city, and all of the coinciding markers and lines on that map gives a general overview of the construction sites throughout the project and are numbered accordingly. <coughs> So starting off on the left here, we just have a brief summary of the construction, ongoing construction projects and what that might entail. And then <laughs> clicking the arrow to the left here will prompt that first project's location. So you can see here, number one is listed at Forest Park. We have a brief summary of everything that's going on, as well as updates and what can be expected. 
And the map here, we have it zoomed in and highlighted of that construction <clears throat> area, as well as a legend provided with the coinciding color. So in this case, we see in progress and under construction. If that particular location were highlighted in purple, that would be un under review, and then blue would be potential. So you can scroll down here, and that will provide you all the information we have, a contact, as well as descriptive photos for that given project. And you do have the ability to enlarge those photos if um, desired. So you can see here, that'll zoom there. If you click X, it'll bring you right back to the um, given entry that you're on. Hovering over these dots, you can see that they are numbered. So if we were to go home, and let's just say um, the Northwestern Lake Forest Hospital is two. So if we hit home, you can see that the number two coincides with that hospital location. So if you know geographically where that construction is, you can quickly go over here to the left and hover over and find that number. So if we hit two, that'll default right to that project. Again, we have the map that zoomed in. We have it labeled as in, in progress and under construction, as well as the website, a uh, brief blurb, and uh, again, the photos that coincide with that given location. So this is really an easy and intuitive and consumable way for residents not only to see what's currently happening, but also sort of the end goal of the city as well, which is really neat is something that you know, really puts that into perspective. Uh, moving on, getting on with some of the city managed and owned projects. If we go down here, um, and we'll just take asphalt resurfacing. Illustrated in purple, there are all those asphalt resurfacing locations. And then again, on the left-hand side, we have when that <coughs> opens, the council meeting, the construction date, construction completion, and then the contractor obviously is to be announced. We're really going in line with the city contact and who a resident can call if they have any questions or concerns, as well as the photo with that given project. And this will be updated as of now on a weekly basis so we can keep residents informed as these pro projects progress. We do have the ability to swap out all this information on the left-hand side. So for example, the construction start is still to be determined and we will populate that once that given uh, entity is determined. And then also with the photos as well, if there is a desire to zoom out that photo, we can do it. So it's completely customizable in terms of the content and we're hoping that this will give residents really a consumable method of giving or receiving the most current and up-to-date information. Uh, and with that, I will open up to any questions. <clears throat> any questions? I, I would a ask you, does the city use smart technology on infrastructure assets? Um, so are, is anything tagged? Can you give me an example? I, I don't know that we would need to, but um, for example, um, on the sanitary linings, do we uh, do we record our infrastructure using uh, tags like you would record inventory in a warehouse uh, with a barcode, anything along that line? So we do have another online application for <clears throat> in-house. So when our engineers go out in the field and assess whether that's being done, they have an application on their iPad that they can mark that complete. That's something that's currently being done with our sidewalk inventory. So that's how they're managing that. But yeah, that the same thing could be transferred and applied <clears throat> to something like this if that were the best method of inventorying those locations. Thank you. Is there a, a general GIS site that you work with, like the county site or who's soft? Because um, <clears throat> I use GIS a lot Okay. Uh, really, all of our data. Hey, Joe, why don't you maybe explain uh, the organization you work for? Okay. So, I work, again, I am a contractor and I work for a company named Mul Municipal GIS Partners, and they are a GIS um, site provider. So, in this case, we are, the consortium is 29 communities and Lake Forest is one of those 29. So I've been assigned to Lake Forest and we build all the data ourselves if we do not get it directly from county. So in the case of, we'll say parcels, 
We receive all those parcels that are updated at an annual basis from Lake County. For addressing, that is all managed in-house. <coughs> and so something like building footprints or driveways or, you know, if there's a new street that comes in, we'll construct that all on our own. Is, is that information available on a GIS site that the public can access like it would be in Kenosha County or? Yes, we do have an interactive map. It's labeled as Map Office and that can be accessed through the city's website as well. On the home page, if we go to maps and parking, and then down to click here to see where I can find my closest park, or I'm sorry, click here to view maps of any property. It will launch you to our public version of map office. Mm. And what this does is if you zoom in or type in an address of a resident, it will bring you to a given location throughout the city. So if I just zoom in here on the right, you could see that the downtown is addressed, <clears throat> the cities are highlighted here, and then we have some additional tools to the left. So in the find, you have the ability to type in an address, a pin, an intersection, and it'll zoom into that given location. And then uh, parcel summary actually lets you access county information. So that would be, uh, you know, similar to assessor data, or in this case, we also have it linked to various information that we manage in the city, such as recycling garbage pickup. So it's a combination of both county data and our data. <coughs> it looks like this has taken a little bit, but you see parcel summary on that city hall parcel. It'll give you the pin, the address, um, the ownership name, and then so on and so on. So fire protection, snow removal, recycling garbage. So we try to make it again, it, the most consumable as we can for a resident and put it all right here. But yeah, th this would be an easy way to consume as a resident what we are managing uh, on the GIS level within the city. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, um, hopefully that if you have any questions, obviously you can always forward them to the staff, but we thought that this was a very robust system that mm -hmm. hopefully will answer most of the residents questions or at least if we can't answer the questions it says who the contact person is that they can get directly in contact with and work through it because our goal is to try and be as uh, communicative as we possibly can with our residents about these projects because as I said it's going to be disruptive but I think the more that we can get information out to them prior to the start of the project at least people then can make accommodations and and work with us and try and work around it. So uh, thank you, Joe and Susan, very much. Thank you. And that I actually do have one, one more evening. question. Oh, do you, is, there a, um, is there a plan in place to sort of proactively communicate this feature on the website? Because I still envision getting lots of phone calls from people and um, you know they could answer the questions themselves much more quickly. Yes, um, I haven't sent anything out yet, but I plan on doing that. Um, it was in Don's mayor's message in the last dialogue. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I've already had a phone call about it, and it just went live today. So we will make sure that the press knows about it, too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That completes my report. All right. Thanks, Bob, very much. Next item on the agenda, comments by council members. Anyone this evening? Moving on, item number four, opportunity for citizens to address the city council on non-agenda items. Is there someone who would like to address the council this evening? Come up, sir. Please state your name and your address, please. Yes, please. My name is David Fontana. I live at 701 West Woodland, Lake Bluff, Illinois. Uh, I have packets I, for each one of you. If I can, can I pass them out or should I? Sure. Okay, one second. Uh, first, I'd like to start telling you about myself. I grew up in Highwood, live in Lake Bluff. Um, I was a police officer in Highwood 
from January 1st, 1991 until July of 1994. After sustaining three injuries, I couldn't do it anymore. I began Dave's North Shore Towing. <laughs> I've been in the towing business all my life. Even when I was a policeman, I did it part-time. I've been on the Lake Forest Police Department police list for 21 years, along with the Holland Park, Highwood, uh, Deerfield, Bannockburn, and now Lake Bluff. Of all the police departments, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. This hurts me very much coming because I've had several discussions with the chief, the former chiefs, the former deputy chiefs, the former sergeant, about asking them to run the tow list fairly. They only rotate calls between nine companies for accidents and abandoned vehicles. They give all the rest to one company. For 30 years, 15 I've been doing it, and H&H &H for 15 before me have been backing that up, that, other, that one company up. It's in there. The chief has told me it's more, more convenient to use them. We all tow for all the police department. In fact, Mr. Fiore from Extreme Towing is here too. We all take release forms from them all. There's over, the one company, as you can see in there, with, I, from all the Freedom of Information Acts I filled out, with just arrests and abandons, gets anywhere from thirty-seven dollars to $45,000 a year in just arrests and abandons. That same company is on the tow list for accidents and disables, which the other nine of us are on, which is an, an additional $13,389. Those numbers for the, nine, the, the other eight companies include our storage. The numbers for that one company don't. I don't think it's fair that such a big, big contract be given out to a company with only one tow truck. I think it should be fair. They have adopted the Hound Park pricing list for police calls. Everybody is on list. Why can't they adopt the rotation and do it fairly? I have personally missed calls because I would go out there, it'd be an arrest, they would cancel my service from my company, and then we would miss the next one. And that has brought, been brought to his attention from the Glenview dispatcher, Brent Reynolds. If it was done fairly, you would never have to worry about somebody being missed, losing a turn. I was diagnosed with progressive MS 10 years ago. It affects me in many different ways, but now I've been told that I'm going to lose my sight and my memory. I have three children to take care of. All I've ever asked for is fairness. I've never asked for favoritism. I know all the policemen. I've never asked any of them for favoritism. All I want is fairness and we've always been given stories. Maybe you guys can come down to an answer why it has not been run fairly. And that, every bit in there is to show you. And the Lake Forest tow list that the Formation Acts show is the, you know, it's only for accidents and uh, disabled vehicles. It shows you all the other police department lists, how they rotate them fairly. It's just Lake Forest that won't do it. So maybe while the chief is here, he can give us all a reason why they refuse to do that because for 21 years I've been asking for it. And now being as sick as I am and the medicine that costs me as much as it does, along with my, all my other medical problems, I think it should be done fairly. This is Lake Forest. This is 2015, not 1970. Everybody else does it fair. Why can't it be done fair here? Any comment, Chief? I, I am, but I'm sure they'll want to hear an answer. You know, Mr. Fontana, thank you for bringing this to our attention and for putting this together. And I would appreciate if you guys can let me know when you get to, the, to, to, a, to an answer. I'll come to any meeting. And there's other things in there you can see of ways to save the city millions of dollars. I, I would be glad to meet with any of you and tell you other changes that should be made that can save the city in 20 years from now $500,000 a year. There's many ways to do it. I know all the insides, all the officers know me. I'd be more than willing to meet with any of you and tell you what else goes on that should be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fontana. We're, we're always open to ideas about ways to save money, so we're grateful for uh, bringing up some ideas. Let us review this, obviously, quite a bit of material and information. Uh, we'll, we'll talk with the chief and certainly talk with Mr. Kiley and, and then get back to you. Thank so you. thank you. Anyone else? Next item on the agenda, items for omnibus vote consideration. There are eight. If there are any that any member of the council would like to remove and take separately, we'll do so. Otherwise, I'll ask for a roll call vote at the end. Item number one, approval of the February 17, 2015 City Council meeting minutes. Number two, check register for the period January 24 to February 20, 2015. Number three, consideration of resolutions supporting the Northwest Municipal Conference 2015 legislative program. Number four, award of bid for modifications to the city's two salt bays, included in the FY16 capital improvement budget. 
<coughs> number five, award of a bid for the replacement of a recycling truck for the sanitation section, also included in the FY16 capital equipment budget. Number six, award of a bid for an 11-foot self-propelled four-wheel drive rotary mower for the parks section included in the FY 2016 capital equipment budget. Number seven, seven, award of a contract for the East train station parking lot improvements. And number eight, request for advanced capital improvement funding to support Gorton renovation project in the FY 2015 CIP budget. Any council member wish to take any of those separately? If not, I'd ask Can for a motion. I'm questions? sorry. Yes. Can we, mm -hmm. I don't want to take it off. Dan. No, go ahead, Alderman. Um, the Salt Bay. Why are we providing Matawa 150 tons of storage at our expense? Michael, do you want to? The village of Matawa, we uh, provide them basically space. They. Uh, we supply the 150 ton and then it is uh, basically brought back to us at the end of, uh, end of the season. But that was something, an agreement that was arranged when we moved uh, from old municipal services out to the new facility in 2009. Uh, they contract to have their streets done. They don't have an in-house staff or in-house equipment that does it. And there was an arrangement that was made back in 2009 to do that, to provide that service. So. They take salt from us at the end of the season, which typically equates to approximately 150 tons. That's brought back to us. Michael, I think the question, though, is how are you, how are you billing them? Uh, we're billing them per ton. There's a, there's a surcharge fee of $5 per ton that we charge them to load them. Um, they'll call us whenever they need it, and they'll be relatively good at calling us early on to, to load their, their vehicles. But that's, that's typically what happens. That's the arrangement. All right, I'm confused. So it's not their salt, it's our salt? Initially it is our salt, but then they replenish it. They are on the state bid. They buy 150 tons from Morton, and at the end of the season, that 150 that they have taken from us, they bring back, uh, or Morton delivers to us. I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, we're spending a couple hundred thousand to beef up the salt bay, and it's not all for us, it's for another community. I wasn't here at the last council meeting when we gave the 40 beach passes away to Matawa. I'm just wondering what is the <clears throat> rationale for us incurring expense for another community that's not our own? Well, I just want to be clear, we're not incurring expense. I think Michael and his staff have figured out what the cost is associated with storing and loading that. And I think that's that $5 per ton charge that they're doing. Uh, so I don't know in the course of a year how much you collect from them, but we charge them a fee for that storage and um, loading of, of their salt. Well, we are incurring <coughs> $200,000 to beef up the salt bay for salt that's not just our own. Right, but I would also say that <coughs> if they went away tomorrow, I think Michael would still say we still need to do the improvements. So oh, that, their 150 I, is a de minimis amount of salt, I think. Correct, without question. The uh, the modifications to the salt bay should add at least 600 ton of capacity, uh, if not a little bit more. Um, but if Matawa was, if we were not to provide that service, I would take that space for Lake Forest Salt immediately. Oh, well, that's question. okay with me. I just, without I question. just mildly opposed to doing it for another community. Well, and to Mike's point, if we're adding 600 ton for my notes aren't in front of me, but 200,000 or 300,000, right? 200,000. 200,000. So we're adding $50,000 worth of capacity to handle Meadow's capacity. Or we'd be adding, I mean, Correct. at I mean, some point, that, that it's a quarter of the bill. Maybe it's not a quarter of the construction, but if we're only adding four times what they're taking up, to solve our problems, it seems that it's 25% is material, whereas 150 tons on 3,800 isn't. But the construction project is certainly, I mean. And then how do they come get the salt? Do we deliver it to them? Do they come no, get they, it? No, uh, they bring Forest Builders is the, the company that they subcontract with to plow all their streets. So Forest Builders calls us directly. Uh, they'll bring their vehicles over and we'll load them directly. 
Uh, oh. Is that so smart for us to let a private contractor come into our municipal services building to take salt out? I mean, are there <clears throat> potential liability issues? Are our personnel not involved in the process at all? Well, we absolutely are involved. I mean, we receive a phone call from them asking, you know, what time they can come over to be loaded. Um, and that happens throughout the winter. And it has since 2009. Um, it, it, it has worked fine. The arrangement has worked fine. The argument absolutely can be made that that 150 tons should be given and allocated for the city of Lake Forest without question. Um, but it's, I think, an arrangement that we developed with them to help out the village of Metawa uh, when we moved to the facility in 2009. And that really is the extent of it. There isn't, there isn't much more to it than that. Well, Mike, is that a year-by-year -year arrangement? Do we renegotiate that every year? Or, Bob, maybe this is a question for you, or is that a... It's, it is a year-by-year. It's year. an at-will kind of thing, and Correct. it's because we're, we're, we don't see it as a huge imposition to accommodate them, and they're paying us some sort of a fee. Correct. Even your family pays cost and overhead, right? I mean, full-cost accounting is full-cost accounting. It's not... We're, we're not losing money, per se, but we're it's because it... <clears throat> It will take us literally minutes to load. Uh, the, I don't even well, think the storage and the correct. loading and, I mean, that's all made $5 a ton because we have this tremendous investment which needs to be allocated over every pound of everything we move or we're not dealing with it properly. I mean, it's costing and, us more than $5 a ton because we have to pay. So, I, I mean, it, well, uh, stretching it. It's a nice thing to do, but right. and but I guess let me clarify something. But at number least one, charge what it costs. Yeah, right? number one, the agreement that was approved last month included this in there. Number one. It did. Number two is that um, if we told Matawa that they either had to come up with fifty thousand dollars, let's just use that amount, or go find somewhere else. I'm sure they would go find somewhere else, and we still would be before you saying we need two hundred thousand dollars to do this. Um, I think we started in 2009 and maybe you were, I mean, we do it for the schools as well, that we just happen to be a, a depository for these other institutions. If we want to get out of that business, we can do so. I think that, um, Alderman Adelman, you raise a good point about the liability issue. I believe we're covered on the liability issue, but I can certainly ask the city attorney uh, to look into that a little more. But it, uh, Mike, every year, he knows that I say this to him, I says, what is the cost, including overhead, of being able, of providing the service? And he comes back, and that's where the five dollars per ton number comes from. Um, every year we look at it, and that's we left it open in the agreement because every year there's going to be some kind of an escalator um, as to what our costs are going to be and go up. So, setting aside the construction costs, which we would have to do whether Matawa is there or not, we are covering our costs, and it's really making sure that we're out there, we're providing the service. Could we tell them to go away? Sure. And I guess they could go to Vernon Hills or somebody else and, and ask for storage as well. But I don't want to mislead you or the, uh, the community that this is not really costing us anything um, because uh, we would be asking for $200,000 to reinforce these salt bays, whether we did it for Matawa and the school district 67 or nobody. Right? Correct. I get that Correct. totally. My issue has nothing to do with the cost. I don't care if we charge them $100 a ton. We made a huge profit. I don't, th it's the concept. I don't think we belong in the business of providing amenities for other communities. Just like we disconnected the water service to Del Mar Woods, which did have a cost to us because our guys were having to flush the hydrants at Old Mill and Waukegan all the time. We don't belong in the business of providing municipal services to other municipalities, whether we're in love with Matawa or not. So it's, David, the, the, my issue isn't the cost, <clears throat> it's the principle, it's the concept. I don't think we should be doing it. And I'd be happy to give the $200,000 if it's all for Lake Forest, but not for Matawa, not for Libertyville, not for Lake Bluff, not for Highland Park. I don't think that's our business. Well, I think uh, we can have that broader policy question because we do a lot of service for a lot of other communities. Yeah. So I, that's I, the policy of the community. I think Staff I, 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 think I disagree with that. Well, you're I, entitled to. I see no reason not to be a good neighbor. And as much as we're in conversation, and Mike, and, and you're a major part of it with how we can develop synergies and share services with Lake Bluff, I think more and more we ought to we ought to expand these types of conversations 
and um, you know trade and work off of each one each other's core competencies and I, I think that's a wave of the future not something we ought to be looking at now to discontinue well, I, I don't disagree with that, Jack, but we're always the host. <clears throat> Matawa's got plenty of land upon which they could build salt base. They've got plenty of tax revenues from Costco. They're not a uh, woe is me community. They can build well, their own salt base. I, I understand the Costco thing, but you know, the big brother generally takes care of the little brother. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's, 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 almost, a, it's almost a fact of, you know, fact of nature. There but, are some uh, reciprocal agreements here i mean this we don't live in a vacuum oh. you know we're not we're not a, a an island unto ourselves we, we have boundaries with these communities and we share interests on many things and i think there is something to be said for you know one hand washing the other on some of these issues it, as opposed to sort of being uh uh you know uncooperative yeah. so i, I you know I, I i i see both sides of it but i i sort of come down on the side of having a good open daily reason to be in communication with these people about various things because when the chips are down you know we're going to need each other bob if, if i'm not mistaken uh, we have we've had a long-standing relationship with matawa with a variety of different services that we provide to them and we get fees and uh, dollars paid to us is that not correct that is correct yeah as, as well as sometimes. as well as matawa as well as other communities as alderman reisenberg uh, mentioned around bannockburn and others but yeah. Don, yeah. They're, they're paying us for services rendered by our professional staff. Who absorbs the pension fund liability for the professional staff? Well, I mean, again, is, Mike, is that amortized in there? Yes. I mean, we're we're yeah. Our, we're, that was our my revenues point. are no. crossing our expenses, well, <clears throat> and the biggest problem we have is pension fund liability. Is it not? From my four years here, that's my understanding. It's the pension fund liability that's killing us. Healthcare. We're not in business. Uh, we're in business to serve this community. I don't think we should be in the business, and it is a bigger, broader policy question that maybe we need to examine at future dates. I don't think we should be in the business of providing services to other communities, unless it really is going to cover all of our long-term expenses, and the pension funds are humongous. And I would say, Alderman, you raise a really good uh, point. Um, we have, in the past, uh, conducted... Um, I think they're administrative overhead studies to determine what that cost is. And so when we uh, look at providing service, and I'll just use the village of Lake Bluff, uh, Matawa, Bannockburn, Highwood, m every one of those agreements included an administrative overhead charge that included some of that. Now, having said that, it does come into play because we just had this experience within the last two weeks that the Knollwood Fire Protection District is now con going to contract starting actually March uh, of next year with Libertyville Fire Protection District for ambulance service. And right now we collect about $149,000, $150,000 a year in fees and charges for that that will go away, but unfortunately we're not able to reduce staff. Mm -hmm. And so part of this trade-off is that we have what I would call excess capacity that we are able to leverage and sell service to these other communities, whether it's building inspection services, elevator inspection services, plumbing inspection, zoning inspection, uh, CROIA, whatever. I mean, we have all those services that we've been in the past uh, selling to our neighboring communities and uh, making sure that it's not costing. Believe me, we're very sensitive to the issue that you're referring to, but unfortunately, uh, if we're not careful, then we're all gonna price ourselves out of the market, but we're, not gonna re we're gonna lose revenue and not reduce our costs. And that's what I'm most concerned about uh, as we look f uh, going forward. Okay, fair enough. Any other comments? If not, I'd ask for- I had another question. Oh, I'm sorry. Too. Yeah, and uh, on the last item, Gordon, the west doors are those just the two doors that are getting replaced for $20,000? I don't know that, Dina. The two heavy wood doors, yeah. That's $20,000 for two doors. Yeah, and if Dan Martin or maybe Mike Thomas might be able to address that, but my understanding is they have to be or maybe Kathy could. My understanding is that they have to be uh, <laughs> I don't think so. That's right. That look didn't get it. And I apologize that Dan's not here, but 
Um, my understanding is that those have to be specifically milled and manufactured for that. We are hoping that it will be something less than that, but that's sort of what we have, uh, or I should say building maintenance has identified as the cost of replacing both of those. And I think the frame might need to be reworked as well, but don't hold me to that. I can get you uh, more detailed information on it. And part of the idea was to try and have the current contractor work on that. Um, and we will be bringing pricing back to you, we think, uh, because the contractor who's really on site right now will be bidding, but we'll also get two or three other bids to just make sure that we're getting competitive pricing uh, as we do it. But we want to try and get the work done while all the other work is being done and not get Gorton done and then come back two months later and close off the west doors. It's just a huge number for two doors. It is. I agree. My reaction was the same as yours. <coughs> Back on the uh, costing of uh, services that we provide, especially to others, uh, I assume we have some kind of costing model that's fully loaded that, that the finance department has developed. Um, at some point, it might be useful to kind of walk through that. Sure, and actually, we can provide you with a study. We, um, I think it's every five years, but it might be every three years, uh, that we engage a company by the name of Oh, we just did it. Um, it's not client first. Um, well, it's a, an, a firm that we've done to basically update that information. And they look at both staffing costs and how we, al these are, this is how we also come up with the allocation numbers to the water fund and the golf fund and some of the other funds. They come in and they look at where the staff spend in their time plus what the overhead charges are and that's where we come up with that number. So I can have Elizabeth send out copies of that to the council because we just updated it within the last six, nine months. Any other comments? I, I just have uh, one on Gordon. I, I think there's uh, a... <clears throat> <clears throat> just because I'm in, in, involved to, to some extent there. Um, the work they're doing there right now is, is rebolstering and rebuilding a place that would have cost the city with its agreement uh, a lot of money on an annual basis over the, over the course of the next few years or the, you know, into perpetuity. And I, the bulletproof nature and in, in, in way that the bully and Andrews and the, and the work that's being done over there, the improvements are right down to making the nails better. I mean, it is really impressive work. Um, and there are uh, some budget overruns, and I think there's going to be a couple more opportunities, I hope, for Gorton to keep that foundation money in place and come to the city for more uh, Im improvements relative to the agreement in the future. And I would just, uh, I would just, I'll be off the council by then, I would think, but uh, um, I would hope they would be welcomed because of the lack of liability that's going to go farther down the, I mean, it, it's going to cost a lot less in the future the way, the way they're doing things now. So a little bit of paying forward for such a high quality project, I hope is re well received. You know, I think just before we vote on the, the omnibus, I, I'd like to make one comment. Th these, these topics that we've discussed related to this are important and timely. And, and Alderman Edelman, I agree. And Alderman Moore, I mean, we are, we're in a fiscal position today that we talked about a year or so ago, uh, a, a what-if scenario. And that scenario is what happens if or when, and it's going to be when, we begin to lose revenue from Springfield. And last week, we began to see the, the start of that happen. So I think we have a, obviously we have a budgetary meeting and a lot of discussion about capital and long-term planning coming up on March 9th. These discussions are very applicable to that. And I, I think it's more than opportune time to, to have some bigger picture, picture discussions, Bob, about kind of where we see ourselves going and the things we're gonna have to do to accommodate the realities of what Springfield continues to thrust upon us. So I, um, I'm, I'm grateful for the council to continue to, uh, it may appear to some that we're looking for nickels and dimes, but we need to find those nickels and dimes. And I think we have an obligation to the community to do that. Could I have a, a motion for the omnibus, please? So moved. Second. A second. Roll call vote, please. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Beidler? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. 
Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Betty, very much. Next item on the agenda, ordinances. Any ordinances to come before the council this evening? Seeing none, item number seven, new business. Uh, I'm, the council will go into executive session this evening pursuant to 5 ILCS. The city council will be discussing threatened or pending litigation. And the city council will also be discussing the consideration of the sale or lease of property owned by the public body. I need a motion to adjourn into executive session, please. So moved. Second. Have a second. Roll call vote, please. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Beidler? Aye. Alderman Moore? Aye. Alderman Pendeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Reisenberg? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. Eight yeas, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Biddy. And Mr. Mayor, I might just mention that it's not anticipated that council is going to take any action once it comes back out of executive session. Yes, that's right. All right, we are in executive <laughs> session. Thank you. Thank you.